Hi, my name is Hayes Raffel, and I'm a UX designer on the learning and education team at Google. And I wanted to share with you some of the things I've learned over the years about what UX is. And UX is a broad discipline that includes a bunch of different sub-disciplines. So let's take a look at that. Um, I'm doing this presentation with two colleagues, Noel Easterday, who is a UX researcher, and there's contributions from Emmalyn Baker, another UX designer at Google. So what is user experience? In a nutshell, it's all about how users use your product. It's the part of the product you touch and see and interact with, whether it's a screen on your phone or buttons on a device. <clears throat> if this dog had a user interface, this child would be interacting with it right now. <laughs> we break up UX into three general disciplines. UX design, which is about the look and feel of the interactive product. Usually it's about the software. User experience research, which looks in detail at people to understand their needs and how they use products. And finally, academic research, which tries to come up with brand new approaches to problem solving. To give a little bit of understanding for these disciplines, I'll tell you about the kinds of questions that people in these roles ask every day. UX designers might ask, is the product helpful? Is it usable? Is it attractive? A generalist might ask these questions. Someone might be particularly interested in user interface design. They would ask questions like, is the software easy to understand and use? <laughs> if you've ever used a website that's very complicated, then they probably didn't have a good UI designer working on it. UI designers work on user interfaces, which are the graphic design, the visual design, motion design, and information architecture of software. Finally, UX designers might be interested in asking the question, is the product easy to learn and operate? <clears throat> People who focus on this question are called interaction designers. And they're most interested in the behavior of the software, the inputs and the outputs, and how these are used in a user interface. Again, the user interface is the part that the user uh, touches and interacts with. It's a screen and a keyboard and a mouse. It's a touch screen. And then it's the software that goes with that. Now, user experience researchers are understanding people's needs and how people use a product. They ask questions like, what do people think or feel about this product? Are people physically able to use this product? For instance, does it fit their body comfortably? That would be a human factors or ergonomics expert who's interested in how the design is affected by people's abilities. Is this product appealing and appropriate to people? These are folks from the social sciences, social sciences who are interested in people and culture, their beliefs and their expectations. And then finally, do people want to buy this? And what is it worth? This relates to market research and business opportunities. That's all from commercial or industrial design and product development. In academic research, people are interested in a brand new approach to solving problems. So someone may be interested in coming up with a better new design approach and they may study human-computer interaction, sometimes called HCI. Someone may be interested in 
the technical solutions, asking the question, is there a better new technical solution? And these folks often come from computer science. My background is academic research, but I've spent the last 12 years working on developing new products in industry. Some people think of UX as an umbrella or a discipline that connects many different disciplines together. And so this is a different picture uh, done by another author that tries to describe all of the subdisciplines. And as you can see, uh, things like human computer interaction and user research are represented here. This author also talks about industrial design. If you become a UX designer, most of the work that you'll do looks something like this. You'll be designing applications and websites for different companies. This is a recent example of some wireframes that I did as part of an exploratory concept where we were starting out with just a very rough sketch under number one, which is called a wireframe. And generally wireframes are just enough to give a feeling for a piece of software so that you can put it in front of users and ask them, would this be helpful? Once you have the wireframe of something that looks helpful, you might fill it in with more detail, making mockups and trying to make it look like a real piece of software. And then you can ask people not only if it's helpful, but also if it looks delightful, if it's something they would like to use. Finally, when you get to the stage of creating real software, you need to communicate to engineers exactly how your software should look and behave. And for that, you need to create specifications or specs and red lines. Red lines are like blueprints, if you've ever studied architecture. They show the engineer exactly how big things should be, where they should be, and what properties apply to them. Here's an example of a simple button that's been redlined, showing its dimensions and also colors and CSS attributes. Within user research, Noelle will tell you more. Hi, everyone. My name is Noelle. I am a UX researcher at Google. Um, previously, I was a high school teacher, and I'm an anthropologist. So I'm a social scientist working in tech, um, and uh, I'm doing UX research because I'm just genuinely a curious person. And the great thing about UX research is that you get to understand people and ask people about their lives and uh, hopefully try to problem solve for whatever may be challenging them um, in whatever ways we're able to here at Google. So today I'm just gonna talk briefly about what UX research is. Um, there are three types of UX research. These are the main categories. And um, the first one being waiting for this to load real quick. Uh, the first one being foundational research. So the main questions we're asking here is, you know, what are the problems we actually need to solve for? And one of the main components of doing that kind of research is to understand who we are asking these questions to. So in this case, some examples may include <clears throat> asking, what do you wish you could do? But you can't do that right now or what would make your life easier right now? Or how are you currently solving your problems? Um, an example of a method we might use when we're doing this type of UX research is an interview. That's where you sit down with one person or multiple people and you talk extensively, either based on a script of questions you've already written out beforehand or kind of a more organic type of conversation you might have with someone. You can do this in person, you can do this over the internet. Um, in some cases, you can do this in written formats, um, but most often and gen generally, the best way to, to talk to someone is when you're sitting across from them. 
The second major type of UX research is tactical research. Uh, this is asking the main question, how should we build a solution for this person? Um, some example questions include, what do you think about our solution ideas? Maybe we've already done the foundational research and we think we might have a solution to help solve your problems or make your life a little easier in whatever way we can. Um, so then we bring it to you and we ask, what do you think about this? Um, another question we might ask is, what are we overlooking? We came up with the solution, but is there something we're missing that we need to understand in order to make the right solution for you? And then another question we might ask is, are you excited? How excited are you to, to actually use this product if we were able to provide it to you? One method we might use includes observation with a prototype. So if we're doing some sort of software solution or tool, we may put together a prototype where you're actually able to click through um, and we might put it on a computer screen and ask you to complete a task and then watch how you do that. Now, this isn't to see if you, you are able to pass a test or not. Instead, it's to give us information of whether what we are actually planning um, to put out there is usable. Uh, can you do the task easily? Is it intuitive? Is it something that you enjoy doing or does it frustrate you or somewhere in between? Um, so this is where observation and seeing you actually use a product would be very helpful for us to get information, to come back and maybe make some revisions or edit some of the, the solution ideas that we're working on. Um, the third type of research is, you know, we've established the problem, we've put out ideas, and we've kind of tested the waters in the first and second um, stages. The third stage is, uh, how are people actually using what we built? Uh, this is after we've uh, put out the product for people to use. Um, we ask questions like, how do you actually use this? How often do you use it? Is it causing unforeseen problems? And is it making your life easier? Is it actually solving your day-to-day -day issue that we're trying to, to help you with? Uh, an example method of this might be survey. We may put out a large scale survey, hundreds, maybe thousands of people and ask these questions outright. Um, that would give us a, a large data set to understand how a, a large segment of the population might be using this or may not be using the tool as we designed it to be used. So these are the three main types of research. Usually it should go in this order where you do foundational research first to really wrap your head around the problem and the people you're trying to help. Um, the second being, you know, thinking through ideas. Maybe you'll show someone um, during tactical research, maybe you'll show them a, a prototype and it won't work. Um, or it doesn't work the way we predicted it would. Then we'll go back to the drawing board, we'll make revisions, and maybe we'll do another round of, tact of tactical research so that we understand how our new edits and revisions, how it, if it actually does it a little better than the first time around. So we may have multiple rounds. And then the third one, when you evaluate how your product is is being used, this is not just um, something that you do right after the product is released, but this is something you can do over time. We know that in life, many things happen, uh, context changes. So when you're building something and you have a solution, maybe the context of the world or the problem changes um, so that maybe the way that people use a product previously is different than how they use it now or maybe the problem that was uh, uh, big enough that it needed a solution earlier isn't that big of a problem now. Um, so this is, the evaluative research happens over time um, and it's something that is constantly ongoing. Now in UX research, depending on how much time <clears throat> we have, how many resources we have, how many researchers we have, who will talk to us, these are all constraints we need to think about when we're designing research programs. So in many cases, these types of UX research could be com 
find, especially the foundational and tactical research. So for example, you might have a focus group with many high school students asking them about issues they might have um, when they're looking for educational video content online. Um, and you may also think this is a great opportunity to show them some design mocks we have for ideas for solutions we think might be helpful. You can do that in one study. Uh, and in many cases, getting that type of information from one group of students um, or one focus group can give you a lot of immediate information so you don't have to run multiple studies. Um, so there's hybrid solutions out there. Uh, if with everything uh, equal on board where you have enough time, enough resources, and um, participants available at any given moment, uh, this seems to be the best uh, sequence of research that you should be um, providing for your product team. So my job, again, I just enjoy it immensely because I get to talk to really interesting people all the time. And I feel like being a UX researcher, my ultimate responsibility is to be able to be the voice or represent the voice of the user to Google, to the product teams, to the designers, and to the engineers, um, and anyone else who, who may um, be at the table. So uh, I enjoy it. I hope you are interested in it. We need many more UX researchers. And uh, I look forward to maybe hearing from you in the future. Maybe you'll be asking me some questions one day. UX applies to any interactive software. Most of the software being built these days are applications for phones or websites but UX would apply to anything else with software, whether it's a dishwasher or a washing machine, or more typically something quite interactive like a digital screen in a car, or perhaps a conversational UI. Generally, we're designing the behavior of the software. So with a conversational UI, you might be asking the question, is the product easy to learn and operate? With, as an interaction designer. And you might even work with a specialist called a UX writer who is just concerned with how the software should speak and how you should speak to the software. UX writers write text strings, they come up with language conventions, and they specify conversational style. So if you're working on the Google Assistant, uh, you might be working with a UX writer that writer would be helping the team understand how to make language that's intuitive and helpful. Within academic research, you might solve unsolved problems in human computer interaction. For example, here, trying to come up with a hand tracking cursor. How might you point at an interactive whiteboard to control documents or 3D objects? Academic researchers tend to know a little bit about all of these disciplines. A single person would be doing UX design, coming up with user interfaces that make the product easy to learn and operate. They might be organizing and even conducting some of their own UX research. For instance, with a project like this, learning, looking at human factors and ergonomics, making sure that uh, design could be used by people with different physical abilities. And finally, looking at other academic research and figuring out if this is indeed a better new design or if someone else has done something that's uh, even more useful than the current concept. So <clears throat> what does it look like to design a helpful product? I wanted to show some examples of uh, concepts that we've done in our own work here in the past. None of these are real products, or perhaps they're things that have already shipped. So uh, let's take a look. Here we were looking at how to make augmented reality something that could help people with online shopping. We were trying to understand if AR could give people a better sense of how furniture might look in their space. And here's a mock-up. 
that gives an illustration of what that software might look like. And you can see hints to interaction design here, showing how a finger might swipe over the surface and control the image, and how a tap might show information about that content. So think of this as an example of a mock-up that's used to evaluate if this design would be helpful. This would be shown to people by user researchers to get feedback. Now, what does it mean to design a usable product? This is something that's easy to operate and easy to learn. This is another example that we did for augmented reality, where we were looking at using a phone to scan a scene that was found on a street. And here we're showing with a video what it would look like for the user to see an advertisement shown over, I think, a bathroom in this case. One of the things that you can learn from these kinds of mock-ups is how people react to it. One of the problems with this design is that when people tried to use this, they would pretend to use it, their arm would get very tired. And that's an example of human factors where people are understanding that this design is a bad fit for the body. It's too tiring to hold the phone up like that for more than a few seconds. And so this design was uh, thrown away after that evaluation. And we went to other designs that were more comfortable, more usable. Finally, what does it mean to design a delightful experience? Usually this means uh, what I like to call the aftertaste of the experience. When you have a nice meal, uh, one of the things that makes a meal nice is the memory that you have of it afterwards. Did it leave a good taste in your mouth? Do you want to have that flavor again in the future? We want software to leave people with a good feeling, a good flavor in their mouth, if you will. And that's what we mean by delight. We bring delight into our software with interaction design and motion design and oftentimes the visual style and simplicity of an experience. We'll work with motion designers or graphic designers to get the look and feel of a piece of software to have a sense of delight. And we'll work with usability experts to try to make it very easy to operate and use so that people don't get frustrated or confused. When we look for delight, we're looking for things that are easy and helpful, but also make you feel good. It's more qualitative. And so we like to do these mock-ups and show them to people to figure out if our ideas resonate with people or not. So now you know the basics of UX. In UX, we design products that are helpful, usable, and delightful. And so now it's your turn. You're going to get some time to design a helpful, usable, and delightful experience of your own that is a better way to do your homework. So oftentimes, when we're starting out, we use very simple product thinking templates. This is a product thinking template that I used to come up with two examples of ways to do your homework better. These are based on existing product concepts, um, just to give you an idea of how the template works. So what we try to do with this template is identify the user, uh, the problem that they have, the alternatives. Uh, existing solutions and how our solution will work better, and a little bit of detail about what the solution is. So in this example, I've taken a product like PhotoMath or Google Lens, 
and broken it down into this template. So you can see how the template works. We say here for the algebra student who is dissatisfied with trying to type a tricky math problem into Google search, our product is the Google camera search app that provides a way to photograph a math problem and quickly go to a website that shows you how to solve it. Unlike typing math into Google search, we have assembled a camera app with optical character recognition technology that automatically turns photos into algebra queries with results like algebra calculators. I did a quick sketch of a student photographing their homework and then a very rough wireframe showing a search results page with the user's query. Uh, as you can see, this is pretty rough. I did this in about five minutes or 10 minutes uh, once I had the idea. This template is nice because it can also be used for hardware products. I've spent a lot of my career working on new hardware. Um, so I thought it would be fun to throw in one hardware product here. This is based on uh, a product that's currently available to uh, blind users. But here I'm imagining it for a dyslexic student. These are reading glasses for the dyslexic student who is dissatisfied with struggling to read books. Our product is reading glasses that provide a way to hear a spoken version of the book you're looking at. Unlike OCR applications, we've assembled reading glasses with a built-in camera, speaker, and Bluetooth connection to your phone, which reads you the print media you're currently looking at, hands-free. So I've shown you one software product and one hardware product that are both aimed at helping someone do their homework better. But now it's your turn. And what I'd like you to do is to go find this slide in the slide deck and make a copy of it and figure out who your co target customer is, what their current pain point is, and to come up with a better solution for them. This target customer could be based on yourself or a friend, someone you know, and the solution should come from your imagination, or maybe it's inspired by two existing products that could be combined to make a new product that's better. For instance, my camera glasses brought together uh, OCR software from a phone with camera glasses, both of which exist on their own today. So I'm looking forward to meeting you and to hearing about your new product solutions. Thank you.